Good morning. How are, you, how are you guys? Everyone well? Good, good, good. Fit January. Are you some of the people I've been seeing running up and down the beachfront? No? Okay, that's gone out the window already. Okay, we're only three weeks in. Time for new resolutions, but don't worry, you can make them in December. So you've got a whole year, but it's so good to see everybody here. And welcome to church. Uh, my name is Swen. I'm the, the lead pastor here in, in our, I want to say Sunningdale Church, but... Uh, we are, we are where we are, amen? And uh, it's so good to see each and every one of you. And uh, please, if you can stay for a cup of coffee or something afterwards, we'd love to get to know you, meet you, and answer any questions you might have as well. And so we're in a series right now called This Is Us. And, and what this series really is all about is simply we are sharing who we are. We're sharing our culture. As I've been saying for the last few weeks that uh, culture is something that you feel when you walk into a room. You, you immediately pick up on the culture of the house. Uh, you pick up the culture of the people that are there. Um, what kind of language? If you if you walk into a if like if you walk into a German house, um, it's all clean. It's sterile. And as you as you, I grew up in a house where I would put a cup down. Then it was finished. My dad would pick up the cup or wipe under the table and put it away. I'm like, that is amazing. I wish I I, I picked some of that up myself. Um, but uh, you, you walk into a place and you already know the culture of the, you know, the culture of the company. And a lot of leadership talks today are about culture because people know, want to have a big dream. They want to um, see something off in the, in the future and they want to get there. But culture is the delivery system to get there. In fact, if you want a healthy plant to grow, you need to make sure that the culture of the soil is healthy because you can put a perfectly good seed into unhealthy soil and the plant will not grow. It'll get sick. It will die. That's why I have no plants at home. But as soon as you put it in some healthy soil, you nurture it, you talk kindly to the plant. Hey, Sarah, you do that. And you, uh, you, you, you just take care of the soil and you, you try not to overwater it and you do remember to water it. And uh, then a healthy plant will grow. And so we're trying to share our life-giving culture of our house. What makes us tick? Who, what kind of a people are we? This is us. This is our home. And we want you to carry that with pride. Amen? And so today, uh, I'm going to be speaking about our third culture point, which is empowering. So the first week, we spoke about always only Jesus. If you missed that, go check it up on YouTube or download wherever you like your podcasts. It's all about loving Jesus with, passionately. Then we talked last week about how this is home, and we want it to be a welcoming place, a fun place, a real place. And today we're going to be speaking about empowering. Before I get into the message, can we pray? Thank you. Father, we thank you that we get to be in your house today. Lord, honestly, we've got so many options living in Cape Town. But Lord, that we can prioritize being here, prioritize the spiritual Lord. Thank you that we get to be here. We get to be with the body of Christ. We get to be in your presence. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts today to receive the word that you've got for us. Encourage us, lead us, and guide us, and correct us in your name. Amen. 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 So, um, I've got a little uh, a vacuum cleaner here. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to clean. Also, not one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> but um, I had this really fancy vacuum cleaner at home, and I forget it. Anybody else, when you leave the house, you have to go in at least three times to make sure you've got what you need. Yeah, it happens to me daily. So um, we got this vacuum cleaner, which is very, very cool. Um, and, and the cool thing about this vacuum cleaner, in case you want to buy it, is that it actually disconnects somehow. And you can use it as a handheld, which is fantastic for those tricky situations. We used this at Kids Church when we were at Alcana because A, it's super light and portable. Um, and B, it can just clean up just about anything, right? Just handheld, go. Like kids drop something, go, 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 go. Whoa, you see there. <laughs> It's clearly a powerful and effective one. It's, 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 I'm going to put that right down and no one's going to get sick in Jesus' name. So, that is pretty bad. Never buy this one. Okay. We will blank this out on the video. I will be holding a Hoover or something like that, a Dyson. So, um, but, you know, I bought a vacuum cleaner um, when I was working at another company and I got it on staff discounts and stuff and it was probably about 4,000 Rand at the time for a vacuum cleaner. You know, the thing that sucks up the dirt. Um, today it's probably half a million. <laughs> but the point is, this vacuum cleaner has incredible value. It's got great value. But unless it's connected to the power, 
it cannot be effective. It cannot do what it was called to do. So you can have this in your house. It's got tremendous value. In fact, you could probably sell it for great value. But until you plug it in, its value means nothing because it's not doing what it was purposed, what it was designed to do. You and I have great value in the eyes of God. There's no one sitting here who is less valuable in the eyes of God. But unless we are connecting our lives to the power that God promises to us, our lives remain ineffective. And we cannot walk in the purposes and the plans that the Lord has for us. Literally, this thing needs to be empowered. It needs to be plugged in. It needs to be given power to do what it was created to do. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus promises, he promises his disciples, when, stay in the city and wait for the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit to come upon you so that you can be my witnesses throughout the world. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, Paul challenges the false teachers and he says, this is not just a kingdom of mere talk, but a kingdom of what? Of power. But how many of you know today that it is possible to be a Christian and not experience the power of God? A lot of us can hide behind religious activities. We can even be at church week in, week out, and we can do the things that we think religious people ought to do, but live disconnected from power. Again, Paul challenges the false teachers in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. He says, they have a form of godliness, but denying its power. In fact, in the NLT, I like how it says it there, the New Living Translation. Next slide. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. It is distinctly possible to look like a Christian on the outside, but be empty on the inside. In fact, so many people could have the fire of God on their life. They could be passionate for Jesus in the start of their race, but somehow through life, lose the flame, lose the power, lose the spiritual edge on their life. It is possible to be a Christian and act very religious and yet not walk in the power and the presence of God. In fact, to Paul, religion that wasn't transforming the heart was useless. And what Paul is talking to these people, he's saying they claim to know God, but their lives are devoid of, listen to this, the work of the Spirit, which would have resulted in holiness, perseverance, and effectiveness in advancing God's kingdom. So it is possible, church, to be a powerless church. It is possible to live a powerless Christian life. But it is also possible to live a life full of the Spirit of God, the presence of God, and walk in the power of God. It's not for the select few. It's not for the super Christians. It's not for the A grade. It's not for the the spiritual elite. It's available to everyone. That's what Jesus came to do, to make his presence and his power accessible to all people. And so just to look at the definition of empower in the dictionary, just thought it would be helpful for us to frame it. It says to give someone the authority or power to do something. You know, this vacuum cleaner has the, pa- has the ability to clean until, unless it's connected into the, not connected into the power outlet because then it doesn't receive the power. But once it's connected to the power, yeah. its purpose can be fulfilled. The second one is that it makes someone stronger and more confident, especially in controlling their life and claiming their rights. You know, you and I, we have rights as Christians, rights as the children of God. When we are empowered with the Spirit of God, we get to walk in the rights of God, the rights of our identity, knowing who we are. We are not haphazard. We are not slapped together. We are divinely created and loved and put together. God has incredible value for us. And so in this week's talk, I'm going to just frame how we talk about empowering here. Okay, how do we talk about it here? Number one, within our empowering culture is this, is prayer. Prayer. To win the battle in the spiritual. That's why we set up the beginning part of our year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we will do another week in August. But it's not like we only pray twice a year as a church. We pray 
every Sunday. We pray midweek on a Tuesday night. Gary and Patty are running a prayer meeting for our church. So we're always praying for you and praying for our community. We, we believe that prayer isn't just something we do collectively, but it's something we carry individually. That when we win the battle in the spiritual, we can then win it in the natural. So many times as believers, we go, you know what, in my limited thinking, my limited understanding, I'm going to try do this first, and then when I mess it up, God, please won't you come and clean it up after me. Instead of saying, God, would you bless us on the front end? Let us do what you want to do, and then God doesn't have to come and clean up the mess that we've already made. So in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 13, well, we, let's read it together. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Just before you move on to the, It's so important because each and every one of us are going to fight battles. Life is full of battles. But we have to make a choice. Where are we going to fight this battle? Will we fight it on the hilltop? in prayer, or will we go into the valley and fight physically? I propose to you that, yes, it, a physical battle needs to be fought, but we first have to go to the hilltop and say, God, we are seeking you first before we go and fight the battle. That's even why it's so important to be in a life group so that other people can be on the hilltop for you as you fight the daily battles of life. Don't do life alone. That's the, the best thing you can do in 2020 is to get into a small group where other people can pray for you, you can pray for other people, and we can strengthen each other as we go through this battle of life and come out stronger on the other side. Next slide, please. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, the other the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. You know what that powerfully declares to us? Is that the physical battle was only won because it was won on the hilltop first. That Moses went to a place of prayer. His hands were up in, in an attitude and a posture of prayer, saying, God, we are trusting you for victory, not in our great military might. We are seeking you. In fact, Moses is known to be a great military leader in the Egyptian army when he was raised up in Pharaoh's house. So, so the fact that he didn't go down into the hillside to fight is a powerful statement that he, th he knew that what they needed for victory was the presence and the power of God, and so he went to prayer and let Joshua fight the battle with the army. In fact, in verse 16, it says, he sets up an altar and he says, the Lord is my banner. He sets it up over, and, and the picture that I get when I read that is that whenever we come to the Lord in prayer, we take everything we're praying about and we put it underneath his covering, underneath his banner. And everything that's under his authority, he can do something about. But when we want to run in our own authority, he's like, okay, well, when you run out of your steam, come back and we can talk, we can help. So we want to put things under his covering. And, and I want to read this the way I wrote it. So, so please forgive me if I don't make eye contact for the next 30 seconds or five minutes. Prayer is not our last resort, but our first priority. God does more with our prayer than all our efforts. No prayer, no power. If Moses didn't pray, they would not have had the power to defeat the Amalekites. We pray like it rests on God, but we work like it depends on us. Unless God fights on our behalf, we have already lost. We go to battle in the spiritual so that we can win the battle in the natural. Prayer is the furnace and the fuel of our church, and without it, we have no passion and no power. We want to be powerful and consistent in prayer so that we may know God in a deeper way and see lives changed. Get this. Prayer is not about God, what can you do for me? Prayer is about how can I commune with my heavenly Father. And in that communion with my heavenly Father, I receive power. 
So it's not about getting God to do what you want. It's about getting onto God's page, God's agenda. We will see lives changed, seas parted, the blind see, the deaf hear, wall falls down, giants slain, the sun stopped, the dead raised to life because nothing is impossible with God. Amen. That is the goal. Come on. So be encouraged. Prayer is powerful. James 5.16, James says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If you love Jesus, the enemy is frightened of your prayers. Amen. The second subheading under our empowering culture so that we can empower this church and these people in this community is to speak life. Speak life. We say it this way. We build people up with life-giving words. You know, we live, in a, we live in a culture and a generation that it's so easy to cut people down with our words. In fact, we cut leaders down. We cut one another down. In fact, somehow we are the, the people we love the most. We seem to hurt the most with our words. We're like verbal assassins cutting people's character. And in fact, in South Africa, we don't have the most amazing honoring culture. I mean, if, if, the, if, if the South African cricket team are winning... Oh, man, they are amazing. If they're losing, I don't even watching. These guys are useless. They need to. And it's the, same with, it's the same with sport. It's the same with politics. It's the same with the church. It's the same with the people we love. And we get this picture in Ezekiel 37. It's a prophecy about Israel being restored as a nation. But we can pick up some really good tips out of it. Ezekiel is in this place, and, and God says, Ezekiel, look around, and what do you see? So he walks through, takes him through a valley of dry bones, just skeletons everywhere. I'd be like, cool, check, please, you know. But, but what happens is, God says to Ezekiel, says, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And you know what I would say? I'd say, no way, they are skeletons, they are gone, we should just cover this up and start over. But, what, but, but Ezekiel, he knows the power of God, he says, oh, Lord. Sovereign Lord, only you know. Only you know what your plan is with these dry bones. And so the Lord says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy to the bones that these bones may come together again. And there's a great rattling sound and, and, and the, you know, the, the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone and the ankle bone's connected to the shin bone and the shin bone's connected to the ankle. Is that a bone? <laughs> anyway, you get my point. And then he says, now son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath that breath may enter into them. And this whole army rises up out of a very dead and dark place. What does Ezekiel walk in? The power of the prophetic spoken word over a dead and dry situation. So today, if you're, if you're in a place of hopelessness, nothing is impossible with God. I have seen and witnessed too many miracles to give up on the most impossible situation. So when we see death as a church, we prophesy life. We speak hope. We speak to the potential of who someone can become. We don't agree with what the enemy says over someone. We agree with heaven's view over someone. So if we someone, see someone who's sick, they can be healed in Jesus' name. They can be set free in Jesus' name. Marriages can be restored again in Jesus' name. Businesses can rise up out of the ashes in Jesus' name. A nation can be built that will bless a continent and touch the world in Jesus' name. So it's so easy. In the area that we, we have faith for, we can speak it. But how about speaking in an area that you need faith in? And begin to say, this is the greatest nation on the face of the earth because God's got such a great plan. Yeah. Words matter. We create the world we live in with our words. What happened in Genesis chapter 1? The most amazing miracle. God spoke. And a world was created. There's this great... Um, I'll, I'll get to it now. 
We recognize the facts, but we release faith and prophesy life. And I want to encourage us, let's build monuments to Jesus in people's lives and talk them up, build them up in Jesus' name. To speak encouraging words over people. We don't need more negativity. We don't need, please, don't, don't tell me, oh, if someone looks like they're just rolled out of bed, say, oh, you're so well-dressed this morning. <laughs> don't, don't flatter people. Speak the truth. Who does God say you are? There was an Ikea experiment done um, in, in the Middle East uh, in a build-up towards the, uh, ant- the anti-bullying day, right? And so for 30 days, they did an experiment. They pretty much said this is not a scientific experiment, okay? So you're going to go online, and you're going to find a lot of things that were wrong with this experiment, okay? But it's a great picture for us. They put two plants next to each other, and these plants, what they did is they put microphones on the inside of them, And one plant was only hearing encouraging words for 30 days. In fact, students would come to this and they would speak, oh, you're so green, you've got so much life in you, you're amazing, you're a beautiful plant. Hey, all the gardeners, green fingers, hey, you like to speak to your plants. I think it's completely weird, but apparently it works, it's legit. You are the, you are the, 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 Sexiest plants on stage. You are amazing. You have a future. Amen. This is a fake plant, by the way. Just I realize the irony of that. And then way over here, they had a plant that they set up for bullying. You're never going to make it. You're stupid. You're not even green. You have no future. You look terrible. And they did this for 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, the one plant was flourishing while the other one was completely wilted. Talking about the power of our words over people's lives. Now, whether or not the plant actually heard those or what, that, that's, that's not the issue. The issue here is that whenever you speak to someone, you can either agree with what everyone else has been saying over them, and you can see their shoulders slump, you can see them walk in defeat, or you can say, you know what? Other people might have said that over you, but the Word of God says this over your life, and you can see their chest puff up, their shoulders get broader, as they begin to believe the identity that Christ had won for them on the cross. That's who we want to be. Proverbs 18, 21, the writer of the Proverbs says, the tongue has power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we either agree with death or we agree with life. The world that we live in, the relationships that we have, are the product of what we speak. So if we speak negativity over our spouse, guess what? We're eating a rotten fruit. If we're speaking life over them, it doesn't mean that they're perfect. Find the thing to to agree on. Find what heaven says about them. And it's going to take faith and it's going to take courage. I know. But what New Testament prophecy isn't, oh, this is the direction. No, New Testament prophecy is the Word of God being released into someone's life to encourage them and build them up in Jesus' name. Lastly is this. The third culture point is gift-oriented ministry. We believe that God's design reveals His purpose for your life. Another way that I like to say it is that we don't raise up volunteers. We release ministers. If you're a Christian, the Bible says that you are a priest You are a minister. At no point did I see any ministers in the Bible take a season off. Um, That's later in the year. We're coming to that. At no point did I see ministers. I mean, ministers were being dragged into jail. Ministers were being killed. Ministers were being flogged. That's what it is to be a believer. God's plan for your life is more than keeping a seat form on a Sunday. God has put gifts, talents, purpose, ability into each and every one of you. If you are breathing, God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and He he has empowered you with gifts for a role that only you can fulfill. So when you're not in it, there's a big piece missing. The church is limping. I don't say that because we need more people. I say that because you need to be involved in the great gift and purpose God has for your life. I love this thing that Einstein supposedly said, everyone is a genius. 
But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. So what we're trying to do is we're not saying, well, fantastic, you, you are so good at making coffee. Could you lead worship? <laughs> Could you sing? I mean, if I got up here and I started singing, we would have to let you in for free and charge you on the way out. No one's going to come and hear me sing. We, wanna, we want you to come alive in the area of your giftedness. And it looks like this. Oh, man, I'm just, I, I don't know what I got, but I, I can meet people. I'm friendly. But what you don't know is that you make people feel instantly at home. So that whenever you're serving on the front line team, welcoming, greeting people, they go, I don't know what it is about that place, but I feel at home. Why? Because God has gifted you and anointed you for that. Not everyone is anointed to preach a sermon on a Sunday, but we're all anointed to preach a sermon with our actions every single day of the week. We want to help you to discover your design, not just your design, but everyone in our community so that we can release people into their purpose. I mean, this is a pretty spectacular vacuum cleaner, right? But at least we know we can suck stuff up. But how weird would it be if I'm like, pour out your love. Air guitar, no? I don't know why I'm down here. I should be up here somewhere. I don't know. But if we plug this guy into the sound desk, nothing's going to happen. And sometimes we think we're going to get involved in a place that we hate. And so we don't get involved at all. But if we get involved in a place that we love, and you actually have a guitar in your hand, and you can actually play the instrument, people will come to know Jesus because of your spot being fulfilled. I don't want anybody to serve in an area that they've got no gifting for and no grace for. But you have been graced by God, and you are gifted by God. And Growth Track is going to help you to discover that. God created each of us with a purpose, and we want to help you to discover that, to be equipped and empowered so that you can make an eternal difference in the lives of other people. Service isn't something we do. Service is who we are. The posture of the church is a serving people because we're serving a generation so that they may know their Savior. No stage elevates a gift above another. In fact, the Bible teaches that the gifts you don't see are more important to the body of Christ. And the church is a body. With each person doing their part, the church will achieve its full redemptive potential. There is a community. There is a city. There is a people around us. If you drive out of this place today, you're going to see thousands of homes being built. Each and every one of those people need you to fit your role, to minister to people in our community, to be involved so that they may come to know Jesus and also find their potential in God, and also fulfill that potential in God, and also get a great reward in heaven. There's two judgments. One, do you know Jesus? And the other one is, what did you do with the gifts and the grace that I gave to you? And I don't want anyone to go, oh, sorry, God, I was too busy, or I was insecure, or whatever. I want to say, I, I, I gave it horns in Jesus' name. So as we close, Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. Paul writes to, this, to the Ephesians church, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when you start using your gifts, talents, and abilities, bringing your best gift to God, some of you are musical geniuses sitting here. Some of you are I don't know, Jedi's on a sound desk or baristas or business owners gifted by God to release funds into the kingdom of God. But you're holding back something. Now is the time to serve like never before and give like never before and to come alive in that. In fact, in Ephesians Chapter 4, verse 16. Maybe you should just read it at, at home. But from him, the whole body joined and held together 
by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I can't be me without you. And you can't be me. I mean, you can't be you without me and the people around you. So we build each other up in love. So what do we do with this? If you're already serving in an area of your gifting, amazing. I'm so proud of you. Well done. You're making a difference. So what do you do? Well, do this. Pray first. Whenever you encounter a battle, pray first. Whenever you want to speak to someone, pray first. Whenever you want to send a text, and you know what's a controversial one? Pray first. Because you can repair the damage later, or you can pray first and let God lead the whole thing. You've got to go have a difficult conversation with your boss tomorrow or a co-worker tomorrow. What do we do? Pray first, because maybe God's going to give you words of life to speak instead of harsh words, life-giving words. Pray first when you want to talk to your wife or your husband. And the second thing, if you're not serving yet, go to Growth Track, 9th of February. In fact, we will give everybody a cup of coffee and a muffin. If you sign up for today, today. And if you sign up today, we will even help you to discover the gifts God has in your life. Brilliant. Why? So that we can connect you to your purpose because your design reveals your destiny. Does it mean that it's going to all work out perfectly? No, it means you're starting on a journey, discovering who God is making you. Growth Track is how we become members at our church. Growth Track is how, because we don't let anybody serve until they're submitted to the authority of the house connected to the vision that God has for this house. So go to growth track. It's like this. It's like being a spectator at the sevens, right? And you're watching, you're watching 14 men and women run around hopelessly in need of rest while you're overweight sitting in the stands enjoying your beverage, watching this happen. It's time to get you out of your seat, to get onto the field and make an eternal difference in the lives of people in our community and in our city. Amen? You can do that at the growth track. Find your place on the team. So you are valued by God. But I want to encourage us that as we leave today, I am valued, but God wants to empower me. God wants to empower you to live the life He's called you to live the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that we get to be here today. Lord, what an amazing, amazing place to be. We thank you for the incredible people in this house. We thank you for your purpose. We thank you for your presence, God. And Lord, right now, we ask that you would, you would move in our hearts and move in our lives. Father, I pray that, that your Spirit would begin to put on our hearts the steps that we have to take today whether it's putting our faith in you, whether it's putting a prayer request down, whether it's signing up for the growth track, signing up for life group, whatever that step is, I pray that you lead us because you've empowered us to take those steps and graced us for these things. We wanna be fueled by the Spirit of God and live beyond our natural capacity, God. So I ask for your empowering right now. I'm going to make two uh, altar calls right now. One is going to be if you don't know Jesus and you want to put your faith in Him today. The Bible says that if you repent, He will forgive you of your sins and give you a home in heaven, in a place in the new creation. And then number two, if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray for that today as well. It's not something we do often on a Sunday. So I'm going to excuse people if they want to leave. And it's not going to be weird or funny. No one's going to run around barking, okay? If they do that, I give you permission to trip someone. What we're going to do is we're just going to say, God, we want your power. We want your baptism in Jesus' name. So right now, if you want to receive Christ into your life, if you want to be forgiven by your heavenly Father and given a place in his kingdom, a place where you're drawn, forgiven, and set free of all your sins and all of your baggage. 
and walking with the Lord. I want to give you that opportunity right now. Because Jesus came into this world to die on a cross, to forgive us of our sins. And then on the third day, he was raised again to life so that we may be walking in resurrection life and have a home in heaven. If that's you today, with every eye closed and head bowed, just shoot your hand up real high. We just want to acknowledge you, where you're at, so that I know who I'm praying for. I'll tell you on three. Praise God. One, two, three. Just raise your hands all over this place. Yes, I see that, sir. Thank you. Praise God for that. Is there anybody else? Because the way you walk in power is you live as a son or a daughter of God. Last one. Is there anybody else today? Okay. If you want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that there is a baptism of water, which is a baptism of repentance. And then there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is receiving the power of God. When you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. But there's a moment of empowering that happens. When we say, Lord, we want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not weird. You're, so, you're in control of everything that happens. So please don't, don't worry. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand right up right now in a posture of, I want to receive that. Because the way you receive a gift is with your hands open. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's not us who baptize, but it's Jesus who baptizes. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill each person with that desire right now to receive your presence, to receive the power that comes on high, to equip them for a great work in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hi there, we want to thank you so much for joining us on the View Church Sunday YouTube channel today. We hope this message has inspired you, it's lifted your faith, and helped you to take your next step in God. And we want to encourage you, why don't you use this message as a tool, as an invitation weapon that you can use to send to people so that they too can be inspired and have their faith lifted. We hope that you have an amazing week, and we'll see you next time.